All right, so functions being independent of variables means that it's not dependent on the variable. So show that f is independent of the second variable if and only if there is. Okay, so obviously, let's do it. So let's 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 first prove this if and only if. So if there exists a g such that f of x y equals g x, then um, then for every single x in y one and y two, then f of x comma y one, well, since f of x y equals g of x, this is going to be equal to g of x. But that's going to be the same thing as f of x comma y2. And so f of x y1 is equal to f of x y2, and that's exactly what we wanted to prove. So that direction, the, the going backwards is um, straightforward. Uh, going forwards is a little more subtle, not in terms of difficulty, but in terms of um, understanding what a proof requires. So given f such that, so for the forwards direction, if we're given an f such that f of x, y1 equals f of x, y2 for all x in y1 and y2, define g such that f of x comma y equals g of x. So, Let's see, well, hmm. The first thing I was going to think, uh, do, do we have to, do we have to prove anything about, um, being well-defined? Well, not really, because G is not a function from R2 to R. It's just a function from R to R. Um. Yeah, so I think... So can we just say to find g such that f of x comma y equals g of x? Just to be safe, the, the, the only possible issue that could come in here is, um, let's say you choose some f of, let, let, let's just say you choose some f of, x comma y1 and f of x comma y2. Let, let's say that you let's say that you define some function g using x and you have f of x comma y1 and f of x comma y2. These will yield different sort of values of g. I don't know. I don't I don't think there's really anything anything more that we need to do here. This is more like a like I'm starting I'm getting a little bit of a flavor of like there there's a lot of type these types of things in algebra like if you're talking about um if you have a function who's defined based on um cosets of a group then you need to generally prove that such a function will be well defined blah 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 there's just a lot of basic group theory um but no, you define G such that um, this equals this, then G exists. Yeah, so what is, I, I, I think, I think the more important thing is the backwards direction, which even that wasn't too difficult, like at all, as you just prove that there is a function which is independent of the second variable. Yeah, okay, so g exists. So what is f prime of a comma b in terms of g prime? And this, this is sort of interesting. I feel like, like you can do it using the tools that we have. It's just, well, let, let's just get into the proof. So g exists, what is f prime of a, b? So f prime at a, b, what is this? This is a linear function lambda 
which goes from, okay, so f goes from r2 to r, so lambda is going to go from r2 to r, such that the limit as h goes to 0, again, is, has vectors of, so I'm going to put a 1 over h out front here, and mul we're going to multiply that by f of, now, okay, so the inputs are, well, actually, no, let, let's, let's, let's do this, let's do this right, so, we're going to take the limit as h goes to 0 as a vector. So how I'm going to write this is the limit as h. I'm going to write h equals the vector h1, comma h2. And this is going to go to the vector 0, comma 0, which is the 0 vector. So this limit of f of, now this is going to be the point a, comma b plus, um, plus h. So that's going to become a plus h1, comma b plus h2. And then we subtract f a um, comma b and now we subtract lambda of h. So that's lambda of h1 comma h2. And now we divide this by the norm of h1 comma h2. Then this is going to be equal to 0. Okay, so f prime, if it exists, because we're trying to prove, or what is f prime in terms of g prime? So this is supposing that it does exist, this is what it looks like, because it need not exist. Um, okay, so this is equal to zero. If we write lambda, now lambda is a linear function from r2 to r. So let's say that x is the first variable, y is the second variable. Then we can write lambda as c1 times x plus c2 times y, where c1 and c2 are just some constants. Actually, let's call them c and d, just so that I don't have to write other things. So cx plus dy. Um, then f prime of a comma b satisfies zero is the limit as h1 comma h2 goes to zero comma zero of f of a plus h1 b plus h2 minus f of a comma b minus, now here we can put cx plus dy, and again we're dividing by the norm of h1 comma h2. And now another way we can write this is we can um, use the existence, since f is uh, independent of the second variable, we can write it in terms of g, and so this is the limit of um, this is just g of a plus h1 minus g of a minus cx minus dy divided by the norm of h1 comma h2. All right. So, what is f prime in terms of g prime? We should expect, so is there anything we can say about c and d? Well, if f is independent of the second variable, then f shouldn't change at all when the second variable changes. So if you think of the Jacobian matrix, um, the second coordinate of the Jacobian matrix should be zero because the there shouldn't be any change in the function as you vary the second variable by itself because f is independent of that variable okay so how do we make that how do we how do we take that and we make it sort of uh concrete and make it rigorous okay so 
Suppose g prime of a exists. If, if we let d equals 0, then what? If we let d equals 0, then what can we say about this limit as h1 comma h2 goes to 0 of g of a plus h1 mi minus g of a minus um, cx minus dy. Oh, no, no, this isn't, this isn't right at all. I'm sorry about this. These x and y's, why am I using x and y's here? C, well, the x coordinate is h1 and the y coordinate is h2. So it should be ch1 minus dh2. And that should be the case for every place where I view, where I've substituted in the um, explicit formula for lambda. Yeah, something did not look right there because something was not right there. Okay, so now we have this limit. So if we suppose that g prime of a exists and we don't assume anything about f prime of a, um, then this limit, and of course, again, we're dividing by h1 comma h2 in norm, then this is going to be equal to the limit as h1 and h2 go to zero of, now, if d equals zero, then it just drops out. And of course over h1, h2, and now, what else do we got? Okay, so, when we take the limit as h1 go and h2 go to zero, this is the only place where h2 appears. And what happens if h2 is non-zero? If h2 is non-zero, then you're increasing your denominator, which means that you're shrinking the overall fraction. And so if we go ahead and just replace h2 with zero, then um, we make the entire fraction bigger. And so we get um, the limit. And also, if, if we just replace h2 with 0, then this limit does not involve, then the, uh, the, 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 form, the, the expression no longer involves h2, and so it, it doesn't need to be included in the limit. So this is equal to the limit as h1. No, this is less than or equal to the limit that we get when we replace h2 with 0. So g of a minus ch1 over h1. And there's some, there's one other thing that we, uh, that I forgot to do here. So suppose g prime of a exists. If we let d equal 0, hmm, yeah, so So g prime of a is given by lambda of h is going to be equal to, it's going to be a linear function, um, lambda h equals c times h. Right, because g is a function from r to r, so if g prime of a is a linear function, and so its input is going to be a real number, its output is going to be a real number, so it can be written as just a scalar time, like lambda of h equals some real number scalar c times h. So if you let c be the slope of the tangent line, for g prime a, and if you let d equal zero, then you get this thing, and this limit is precisely equal to 
zero because CH1 is the derivative of G at A. And this, th this limit equals zero precisely when CH1, when, um, when this is the derivative evaluated at H1. So we have this is less than or equal to this equals zero. Okay, so then, so this thing here, this expression must equal zero, this thing here, because it's an absolute value. It, it's a fraction of absolute value, so it's an absolute value, so it's a positive number, and it's less than or equal to zero, so the only positive number which is less than or equal to zero is zero. All right, so what does this tell us? So lambda of h1, h2, equals, now what do we have here? We had c h1 minus d h2, so this is, um, so this is c h1 plus d h2. And so we can write this as um, as a Jacobian matrix. We can write this as, well, what is C? C is just, um, we can write this as C as G prime of A, and D is just zero. So this is the, well, I'm not, okay, okay. I'm being I'm being a little sloppy here. Let's let, let's go back. So lambda equals this equals um, g prime a h one is is precisely the derivative of this is precisely the derivative of f at a b. And by the way, the Jacobian matrix is take g prime of a comma zero. And again, this writing g prime of a here, this is a little in in this in this textbook we're we're using a little more general notions. And so, when you think of a derivative at a point that's not a number, it's a function. But when I say g prime of a here, what I mean is it's equal to the the slope of the tangent function g prime of a and the reason that i'm able to put that in here is that g is a function from r to r and so this slope is just a real number rather than in the case of g we're like in uh higher dimensions then uh then g would give you a linear function um and so the coefficient would be a matrix rather than just a real number. But but this is this is this is fine here. So yeah. So basically, the, if you have a function which is independent of so here here's here's the main idea here, is that if you have a function which is independent of the second variable, then if you want to take its derivative, what you'll end up with is you'll just be be taking whatever the derivative is in the first variable and then the derivative in the direction of the second variable is just going to be zero which makes sense when you think about it um, sort of like the, this problem in general it's sort of a logical problem this makes sense um, when you think about it but you really need to put in the work in and write down all of this stuff that I have here in order to make it rigorous um, and I guess that's really the tricky part of this problem, is not seeing what the answer should be, but figuring out how to use the tools that you have at your disposal to get to the answer that you want. And so, yeah, that's, that's all we need for this proof, and so now we're done.